when God had given me the vision for my business, the main concern I was like, I am definitely going to have to show up was not being labeled or categorized in that same category of like being a Christian influencer who has a business and who's not following through on their word and who's like scamming clients. That was the last thing I wanted. All right. I'd like to welcome everybody to the second episode of the Rooted in Christ podcast. My name is Eric Stevens. I hope everybody is doing well today. And my guest today, we have a very special guest. I'm excited to have her on with us. She is a wife, a mother, teacher, a life coach, and soon to be best-selling author. We're just going to put that out in the atmosphere um, right now. Dr. India Logan. Doctor, how you doing? How you doing? Thank you so much for that introduction. I appreciate it. All is well. God is good. How are you? I can't complain. I cannot complain. And I am actually going to hold this up because look what I have in my hand here. (laughs) And I got it right this time because, you know, mirrors everything backwards. So we got the book up this time. (laughs) So (laughs) if you are listening um, to this podcast and you happen to see this uh, trailer on Instagram, please in the, in this post on Instagram, excuse me, Please go to the comment section below and type in hashtag Christian Life Coach to get a free copy of her book. You do not want to miss out on this devotional. It is phenomenal. So I'll be blessing somebody with with a copy of this. So so how's everything going for you? All is well, busy, of course, um, just leading in ministry. And, you know, now that the devotional is done, I thought surely I'd have a lot more free time, but God had other plans. And so <laughs> yeah. I'm hanging in there. And so you got the book out, you got the devotional out. You also have the the Life Coaching Christian Academy. So talking about that, like, how is that going? What, what's been going on with that for our listeners? Man, you know, I, I'm so thankful. So this was a vision that God had given me a few months ago. Um, I'd woken up and immediately I looked at my husband and said, God said, coach the coaches. And I had been a coach for eight years already myself. And then I thought, Man, I never in a million years thought that I would uh, have the the ability or the potential to certify other life coaches. In fact, initially I thought I'm just going to be a licensed therapist, but then God had other plans. And so when I went into the field of coaching, there was, you know, there was like crickets. I didn't have any clients yet. Right. And then I built up clientele over some time, built up some social media presence. And I thought, all right, this is nice. This is good. I have some consistent clients. And then when God woke me up that random morning and told me to coach the coaches, I was like, now that's, that's new. I didn't, (laughs) wasn't anticipating that. And so, you know, it's been a blessing. It's been a journey. And, you know, if I can be a hundred percent transparent, there's been more ups than, than any downs. And I, and I pray it stays that way. Um, And I know with business that, you know, it could be a rocky start, but when God is in the mix, and when God leads you to that mission and that vision, um, it's not to say that there won't be any ups and downs because the Bible does say a dream comes with much business and painful effort, but it is to say that you're going to have a whole lot of blessings and peace for obedience. And so I have to say, that's what it feels like. A lot of blessings and a whole lot of peace in my heart. So for anyone who, who doesn't know, or they're not aware, what, what is a life coach? Like what, what, what would you, how would you define that? What do you see their role is in, in someone's life? Wonderful question. So a life coach is someone that walks alongside you and helps you to meet any goals pertaining to interpersonal goals, relationship goals, um, breakthrough healing goals, um, maybe breaking down mental blocks and having a, you know, positive mental health shifts. Um, And so uh, a coach's goal is to help you meet your goals as a client. And so if you were to consider that in comparison to that of a, a counselor or consultant, a coach is focusing on the present for the benefit of someone's future. While a counselor hyper-focuses on the past for the benefit of someone's present. And a consultant gives advice. And we don't give advice, we ask thought-provoking questions that lead clients to their, the answers that they do have within that they just don't realize they have until they're asked the right questions. And then coaches allow the client to kind of navigate the conversation And until it's time to create a plan of action, which we call a POA. And in that plan of action, we create milestones with every client that leads them to ultimately meeting a much larger goal. Okay. So is it, so when someone comes out of the Academy, what, what kind of, is there any advice you give them like right away? Like maybe you should look to have this X, Y, Z amount of clients. Like what advice would you give to someone just fresh out of your Academy? Who's looking just to dive into life coaching? 
Well, the beauty in coming through uh, Dr. India's Christian Coaching Academy, also known as CCA, that's our shorthand. Um, the beauty of coming through the program is that we spend an immense amount of time doing live trainings where I teach them different marketing tactics and, um, and networking. So I think we talk large in part about the power of networking and the, the need to be extremely personable in every context because everyone is a potential client. And so um, my advice coming right out is to stay connected, you know, stay connected with all the other coaches that they went through the program with and to continually network in every capacity and to come prepared, make sure you have your business card in the elevator speech. You just never know who you're going to run into, who are you going to talk to? And so my best advice is to always stay ready for potential clientele and live coaching being a multi-billion dollar field has several streams of income and opportunities for growth in every capacity. So I always tell coaches to remain extremely flexible for the likelihood of them operating in a role they didn't initially think they would. So when most coaches go through the program, they think, oh, I'm going to build a client tell and I'll lead one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, but there's so much more to coaching. Um, and I wish I had had a mentor to tell me that, but there are several streams of income that can come from coaching. So there's one-on-one -on -one coaching, there's group coaching, there's podcast paid, paid advertisements, there's seminars, there's workshops, public speaking, book deals, webinars, there's virtual courses that run evergreen, which is passive income. The list is endless. And so I tell my coaches to be uh, prepared to market themselves and to be flexible to, to operate effectively as a coach in any capacity. So let's go ahead and, and put the info. So if they want to join, which by the way, I am a student. I am less than halfway through the program right now. I need to get on my game and get through this, but it is a phenomenal program. I actually learned a lot. It's, it's really thought provoking for how you, the type of life coach that you want to be. It, it was one of the, it's probably one of my favorite lessons was trying to break down like what kind of coach do you really want to be? What kind of clientele are you really looking for? So um, that was really beneficial. It's crazy to think that I didn't think about that. He was like, okay, I'm ready to go be a life coach. He's like, yeah, but for what? Of what? Yeah. <laughs> What's the niche area? Yeah, what exactly will you be coaching, sir? I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> so, so it helps. So how, if someone wanted to join the academy and be a part of that, what do they need to do? Large in part, you just go to drindialogan.com, go ahead and fill out an inquiry form. And um, at that point, uh, you'll receive a follow-up email that gives you the details on next steps. And you can either join and watch a, uh, an informational that was recorded from a previous time, or you can join an informational, an upcoming informational. Typically, they are spaced out. Every two weeks, I have a live informational where I join on Zoom with prospective students to navigate the conversation of what CCA entails what it is how what the christian life coaching field looks like and um i ask any questions we do q a some prayer and then that's that's the next step from this point there you go so vision what vision wise like long term and short term where do you see the academy going wherever god wants it to go um i i know that's interesting because see typically when people come up with business ventures it, it's like large in part, it was a seed that God planted and that they ultimately saw later down the line. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was like, I woke up randomly one morning and God had told me, this is what you're going to do. I, I had no, there was no, this was a dream all my life. There was no, yeah. none of that. It just was like, you're going to do this now. I was like, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> so in terms of vision and, and, and expansion, it really is based on God's, God's desire for CCA. And by God's grace alone, it's been continually growing and expanding. And I just can, I just mm -hmm. keep saying, God, whoever you would have come through this academy, uh, use me as your vessel, you know, use me as your mouthpiece. May I be the hands and feet and, and do whatever it is that you need me to do to be effective and influential and impactful in their lives. And so that's where I am. I would love to see it blow up and be like, you know, just thousands and thousands of students go through the program. Um, but it's whatever God wants. And in it's, in it's in his timing because it was his vision to begin with. He just entrusted me with it. And I'm ever so humble and thankful that he would. It's crazy. You mentioned that because it's just like, God, here's my yes. And just do what you want. My obedience. That's, that's yeah. what it is. Cause I, yeah. 
if I if you would have told me a few years ago that I was going to be running a nonprofit and now doing a podcast, I probably would have laughed and walked away. <laughs> like there's no way right. I'm going to be doing this, right? Like, but God put something on your heart. And it's like, okay, God, this I know that this was not me, and I it it amazes me how sometimes He does those things to keep us faithful, to keep yes. us humble, and to just be like, okay, look, I had nothing to do with this. I know this wasn't me. All right, God, this is you. I'm going to give you all the credit for this, and it's. I don't want to say it makes it easier, but it does make it a little bit more realistic when it's like, how did this happen? This wasn't even my thought. This wasn't even yes. in my plans. So, yes. so yeah, obviously there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes that people just don't see. So talk to me about that, like the late nights, the, the early mornings, like what, what has this process been like to, to really get this thing rolling? It was, it was rigorous. Um, more in the beginning, like it, it, when I first, when God first had given me this vision, I was on like go mode. I felt like I got zero sleep for the first like month when I was first starting out, trying to market it, trying to make sure I had all my materials, then trying to build out everything like the student learning platform, trying to record everything, get all the documents organized and in order, get all the PDFs organized and in order, prepare for live trainings with students, uh, do marketing with like doing informationals, gathering and, um, client information. Like it was nonstop. It was around the clock grind, <laughs> but you know, I, I look at it like when it was Jesus, when Jesus was walking the earth and he had a, you know, a three-year ministry right there in his early thirties. Um, I, I wondered how much sleep, sleep he got, you know, and I know that his calling was far bigger than ours. But I just, you know, he sacrificed so much and I don't want to not be dependable. I think my greatest heart's desire is to be a servant that God can say, I can rely on this one to do it. I can depend on her to do it. Um, I trust her to do it. And so not waking up, not being disciplined or obedient is not an option for me. That's good. I can't afford that type of disconnect and spiritual discomfort that it, that would come with it. I feel like it's too expensive to my relationship with God for me to not show up the way I need to. And then large in part, because I'm a representation of, of him, I have to, I have to go hard at everything. Right. Um, so there's no room really for me to do things halfway, half, halfway effort, halfway uh, attention or energy. There's really is no room for that. Um, particularly when I, be, I believe in the depth of my heart that he has gifted me with the capacity to work hard, to go hard, to be motivated. I feel that motivation is a gift. I think sometimes when people get ready to like embark on something, I, I think they forget that God has seen the end from, from the beginning, right? So he, he's already equipped you to do exactly what he's called you to do. You know, so it's that's a man. That was good. That was good. Yeah. So yeah. How, at this point now, like how how hands on are you? Like, do you have a staff? Are you looking to get one? Like, how how hands on are you with everything that's going on with the academy? I'm hands on, but I do have an intern. I, do have an intern. <laughs> I had to. I had to, and you know, she's one heck of a help, and I'm thankful for her. Um, and I have other people who are reaching out to be uh, staffed. And I, I told them by next year, I'll be definitely looking to do that. Um, but right now we are steering the ship and nobody's felt, nobody has fallen to the wayside and I'm thankful for that. So if it could be manned right now by, by two people and Jesus himself, <laughs> um, because one of the best business practices that I, that I preach to my students about is not having too much overhead. Um, I'm a daughter of a business owner myself. My father is, he owns several businesses and has ever since I was a little girl. And I've learned a lot of his, his errors. The Bible says a smart man learns from his mistakes, but a wise man learns from somebody else's. Mm -hmm. And I paid a lot of attention to my dad. Um, and I, and I took his mistakes as, as my, um, grooming ground for wisdom and in preparation for my own business. And one of the mistakes that he made prior to the pandemic was having too much of an overhead. Mm. And, I, you know, in the spirit of transparency, he, he would publicly have this conversation. So I believe it's okay for me to express this myself. 
it, you know, he had already hit his first million, but because he had too much overhead, he didn't see that and he should have been able to. Mm. And so his business took a hit, took a loss, and um, he's, he's regained traction and covered ground since then, but it taught me not to hire too many people too, too fast, too soon. So I will eventually, but I'll take my time with it. That makes sense. That is, I hope everybody listening, like wrote that down or like we were on that just to save it. <laughs> I'm taking notes right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause right now it is me, myself and I, and it is God carrying me through this. So, <laughs> well, you know, and he's a free employee, so <laughs> he owns it, right? Like, <laughs> I'm glad he's free. Cause I don't even know what his cost would be. Like, I just, right. I, what do you, what do you got on payroll? Jesus. Like, I don't even, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What do you, what would you say your biggest learning curve has been so far? Like is, I know you just gave the the analogy, the the um, example of your father, but so starting this, what would you say your biggest learning curve has been? So if you learned from someone else and what they did and did not do, just you going through this, what 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 would you say that is for you? You know, I have quite a bit of students, and some of which have. Um, everyone learns differently. Everyone has a different learning style. And there's a strong need for humility in approaching teaching, uh, particularly when you're teaching students from all walks of life, all walks of life, all cultures and, and demographics, age-wise, um, different political status, you know, different SES, social economic status, so on and so forth. And even some different awareness about faith. Mm -hmm. And I think the learning curve then becomes not to expect that just because I believe I'm teaching good, that they're learning good. So uh, taking the, the time to be humble enough to say, how can I be better as a teacher or what remains a gray area for you that we have discussed? And recently I... <laughs> <laughs> my students who had been in the program for like the past two months timidly and I don't know or I wouldn't say timidly but cautiously posed this question because I said what questions do you have that you feel like weren't answered to your um to the to, to the best of my ability to your understanding and they dropped in the chat can you please break down how counseling and coaching differs and we spent two hours dissecting that mm. because they were seeing where they merge. And I'm not denying that the two professions don't have a tendency or proclivity to merge a little bit from time to time, but there is a need to have a strict and strong boundary as not to violate that the one or the other profession, more so the counseling because it comes with licensure and so on and so forth, whereas coaching is an unregulated field. And so we dissected that like you wouldn't believe. Like I, I was thinking to myself, I don't know if there's any other more elementary way to break this down. And I don't mean elementary to be condescending in any way. I just want to make sure everyone thoroughly and fully understood it. So my learning curve was recognizing their learning curves. So for anyone who may not know, what do you see is the difference between counseling and then life coach? Like what is some of the, 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 well, what came out of some of that discussion? Oh, good. Yeah. Great question. So fundamental differences, once again, as counseling does focus a little bit more on the past and ha having people kind of navigate their past traumas or their past experiences and how that affects their present. And it's not to say that they're, they cannot discuss present presenting circumstances or problems, but a lot of times a therapist will delve into how the past might be impacting the present. Um, mental Ill illness diagnosis are often given <clears throat> within a counseling context. Thus, that would mean a treatment plan would have to be issued as well. Within treatment plans, you'll, you'll find that there's maybe a schedule for therapy and also medication. Um, and so that's a little bit more of a complex field that requires a lot more time and study and supervision and so on and so forth. Well-respected field. I, I love it. I was in it, not licensed, but definitely in it. And I was a 
um, psychiatric evaluator for quite some time. So I have a full awareness of different mental illnesses and even the medications that most psychiatrists prescribe for different mental illness. While I have a lot of respect and regard for the field, uh, the pitfall in my view is faith. When faith comes in, it gets a little tricky. Um, and I had, a, I had qualms with that as a Christian and as someone who struggles immensely to leave God out of any conversation, but particularly conversations pertaining to mental illness or struggle or past or healing and trauma and so on and so forth. So that is the totality, or maybe so in a nutshell, a, a concise way to describe counseling, whereas coaching is what is your presenting circumstance or your presenting problems and how are they impacting your, uh, your life? How are they affecting your life right now? And how does that affect your future? And we have some goals that we want to accomplish. That's great. So sometimes in therapy, there's this hyper focus on mental illness diagnosis, whereas in coaching, there's this, who are you outside of the diagnosis? Who are you outside of having depression, outside of having the anxiety? Because it doesn't have to be so all consuming. It's not the totality of one's character and existence. It's just one part. And so what about the other aspects of that person's existence, identity? Who are they outside of that? Do they have goals, you know, goals to be in business, own their own business? Or, you know, do they have interpersonal goals where they want healthier relation, relationships and they implement boundaries and standards at ease? You know, so those are things that coaches navigate. Um, we're not hyper-focused on the mental illness. We're hyper-focused on the totality of the person outside of it and what interpersonal goals or outward goals they might possess. And so we work to navigate that conversation by, for instance, if a client comes in and they say, you know, I, my mother verbally abused me my whole life and made me feel like I'd never amount to anything. And it's not that the coach is going to be dismissive as that could be truly hurtful to a client, you're going to want to acknowledge and validate their experience and their feelings. It's just that the coach will not spend too much time or an extensive amount of time uh, digesting that. Um, more than likely, the coach will end up digressing and saying, how does that, how are you living currently with meeting your current goals? And that client, that same client might say, well, I have a goal to open up a beauty shop, but I don't see myself doing that. And then the coach goes, well, what are those thoughts that you're currently having right now um, that make you believe you, you can't do that right now? You don't see yourself doing that. And maybe she goes, well, I just feel like every time I try to get started, there's so many roadblocks. Hmm, let's talk about those roadblocks. What are some of those roadblocks? So we're dissecting her presenting concern. And then we're going to ultimately, after having asked a bunch of thought provoking questions to get clarity about her specific situation, we're going to navigate the conversation of creating a plan of action where she's coming up with milestones that are, the coach will help her come up with milestones. So these milestones have to be agreeable to the client, right? Because the client is not going to start meeting these milestones if the, if the client's not in agreement or not feeling like they actually have the capacity to do so. And ultimately in meeting the milestones, you're reaching that goal. You're getting to that goal step-by-step. Step. And so the coach walks alongside the client more as a friend and somebody like an accountability partner from time to time as well. Whereas a therapist is more so let's dissect what went on back here. How's your mental illness affecting you? So on and so forth. So a coach looks outside of that and says, what are your goals? Is this actually sparks a question for me. Has there ever been a scenario where someone has came to you for life coaching and you know they actually need a therapist in like to for step one? Or is that like, hey, you need this and we can work on this in conjunction? Is there ever a scenario it's like, well, you know what? I need to refer you to a therapist because this is actually not what I'm here to do as a life coach. Too many times to count. Sometimes the majority of the clients that most coaches encounter have either A, had therapy before, B, need therapy, or C, could benefit from both. But the main thing that I teach my, my students is to cover yourself, cover yourself and cover your business. Obviously, you want to have business insurance, but you are going to want to make that clear, that distinction clear up front. I am a coach. I'm not a licensed therapist. These are the differences. I believe after listening to what your presenting concerns and needs are, you could benefit from having a therapist. 
That does not mean that a coach cannot be helpful. These are the things that I can help you in. This is the capacity at which I can help you in. But I do believe that you could benefit from counseling. And if that specific client is truly suffering and they're in a very debil debilitating state and you recognize some you know, red flags, maybe in terms of suicidal ideation with intent or you know, hurting other people, so on and so forth, or just extremely depressed and you know, it, they truly need help. I always teach my students that you can require that the client go see a therapist before they have, have services with you. And you don't want to infringe on their privacy, but you can say, I really believe that therapy is what you need and I'm not the right fit for you. This is why when you start a business, contracts is, are important. <laughs> yes, contracts and awareness because knowledge is power, but it's not powerful until you use it. So right. contracts and awareness. Right. So based off some of that, is that why you went the university route, like in starting this process to teach people all of these things? Like, is that, is that how this really, is that what, just to make sure like, hey, this is the difference between this part, which is therapy or the medical piece or the diagnosis piece. Is that why you went the route of the academy? I went the, I, when you mentioned that, are you referencing why did I go to coaching instead of, yes, you know, like, yeah. Well, and you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It could be, it could be, and it could be a counselor and coach. In fact, I have a lot of licensed therapists in my program who are seeking the coaching certification. And I'm, I'm really good friends with the largest coaching body that exists. Most of their coaches have previous therapy education and they're licensed therapists as well. What I decided was large in part, part of my testimony. It's just that when I was pursuing my master's, God had given me the gift of my son. And I wanted to finish the program before giving birth because I wanted to be consumed with just parenting. And so I fast tracked to a master's of psychology program that did not allow me to get licensure. So I did not have the ability to get licensed as a therapist. Now I thought this was to my detriment, to my downfall. I was going, I was doing all the things, God, why me? Why, why, why did I mess something up until one day God said to me, it's a box. That's not a hit out on therapists. But what he was saying to me is you keep trying to put yourself in a box and I've got something far bigger than what you're trying to pursue. And I look back in retrospect, right. And I reflect and I say, wow, if I had gone that route and gotten licensed, I would have never gotten a life coaching certification. I would never have thought to, I don't think I believe I would have thought to research it or think about it or do it. I would have just stuck to therapy and called it a day. But God said, no, because I need you to see the benefit in being a coach. And I see how much more beneficial it is for me, particularly in my life. I can only speak for myself right. um, to be a coach because I'm a certified Christian life coach. So that gives me the ability to talk about the Bible, God implement my faith in my business. It's an unregulated field. I don't have a boss or a licensure board trying to breathe down my neck. And I also opened the Academy because of that. So God saw far, far in advance. Thank God for the foresight, right? right. Amen for the foresight okay. that he had to say, I want you to open a, an Academy way up here. And you probably won't do that if you go this route. There you so, go. That's why I'm here. So when you, whenever you talk about this, like your passion, it clearly comes out. So like, this is, this is your, this is your business. Like, this is what you're, you're into. How hard is it to just, you know, I need to take a break. It's time to go on vacation. It's time to just feel like, how hard is it when it's yours and you're the, you are the main employee. Like, how hard is it to just be like, okay, you know what? I need to go to sleep for eight hours. <laughs> how hard is it to step back and refuel? It, you know, mm. It is difficult. I took my, my family to the cabin towards the beginning of me opening CCA and the whole drive there, I was answering emails. <laughs> I kept promising my family that as soon as we got to the cabin, I was going to be shutting off my phone and I wasn't going to be looking at these emails. And we got to the cabin and I was wrapping up my last email. And I was thinking, dear Jesus, can they live without me for two days? Cause I, I I'm, and so it's more so that, how do I say this? It, this is going to take a left turn that you probably didn't expect or anticipate. And, and I'll circle it back. Don't worry. Sorry. But there were a few Christian influencers that I felt offended by personally, because when you, when you proclaim to be a Christian, you know, stick by that, be truthful, be honest and do business the way God would have you to do business. There were a few Christian influencers who unfortunately um, 
marketed a, a business venture and did not follow through on their promises to their clients. Mm. And because of that, I know that they're dealing with legal stuff, but because of that, a lot of people were hurt by Christian businesses. Mm. And that hurt me to think about. And this was prior to my Christian business being launched. And I thought, man, you're a representation of Jesus. You are in the spotlight. You have a large, you know, you guys have large followings, large clientele, and people trusted you. And you slapped Jesus' name on your business venture. And you didn't follow through or keep your word. So because when God had given me the vision for my business, the main concern I was like, I am definitely going to have to show up was not being labeled or categorized in that same category of like being a Christian influencer who has a business and who's not following through on their word and who's like scamming clients. That was the last thing I wanted. Like, that's not a thing I wanted at all. Not even the last, right? So when I rest, sometimes I fear that someone either fell through the cracks and I didn't communicate, you know, fast enough, or I didn't process something fast enough or that somebody's going to need me and I wasn't there when they needed me. And then suddenly they're thinking, well, Dr. India is scamming me or whatever. So in the beginning, it was hard for me to rest because that was constantly on my mind. Like they created a bad reputation for Christian influencers. You will not fall in that category. You are going to be a Christian influencer that people can trust that people can know they're getting quality material from and that people can say, no, I got the bang for my buck. Like I didn't pay for nothing. I paid for something. Mm -hmm. And that was so big to me. And so it was really hard for me to rest in the beginning because of that. Now it's hard for me to rest because I'm a bit of a workaholic, which I know is simple. Okay. I'm, I'm humbly admitting that there was a Sabbath rest, Mm -hmm. right. And God gives rest to those who work diligently and I do my best but I cannot sometimes turn it off in my mind. Like, and so I've been doing a better job at allocating and delegating, Mm -hmm. but giving some tasks to my intern. And that has been a blessing. But one of the things that keeps me grounded is knowing if Jesus rests or if God rested, who are you to think you don't need to rest? Mm -hmm. And God did not give you this entrepreneurial endeavor and business venture for you to think that you're never going to get rest or that you don't deserve it. So that's where I am. I think you said something really good that when we start to, as soon as we tell people, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, that microscope, that, that lens is on us. That light is there. And it's just like, they, people start watching you close, even though they act like they're not. And there's always people watching you that you just don't, you can't even imagine with, but in the same token, there's people who look up to you who may not even tell you, or people who look up to you who may not even see for years, you know? So I think it's important that is whether you're influencing, whether you're leading is to walk in that, that authenticity that Christ is, is providing. It's like, we're going to do this under God as best as we can. And that's why it's important you know, what are we, what are we putting into us as, as leaders? Because you can't pour out of an empty cup, right? Like we know right. you can't do that. So what are you filling up with? Because that's, what's going to, to come out to those, to those people. So that's been one of the main things I try to do with Redwood. I'm like, this is not about money and, and spotlight. This is, I, you can't see the bookshelf because I have the camera facing the other way. I have a shelf full of Bibles that we're putting in people's hands for free. For example, this is no right. one is looking to I want the I want Jesus. When you see me, I want to show you the best representation of Christ that I possibly can. And I think that's I think that's critical. I think people are looking for that, even if they don't know they're looking for that. They're looking for that light and that salt. And they they know when it's genuine and when it's not. They know. Yeah. Yeah. That you know, and you, you nailed it. They they're looking for the salt and light and they can sense it. People have Holy Spirit discernment as well. And they can sense when you're authentic and genuine. And people love authenticity and 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 they love they will fuel what's genuine, right, to them. But as you mentioned, it's not about money. It's about ministry. Right. And if your heart's posture is not in the right place, God sees that and your ministry doesn't get blessed. Right. Just because you get a vision from God, if you fumble that vision, if you do the wrong thing with that vision, you'd be afraid, you should be afraid that God's favor is no longer over that. And the last thing I ever want to do is to be walking in what was supposed to be a God-favored vision. 
and mm-hmm. not have the favor of God because I decided, right, to make something else my God in that season. So when money started to flow through to, into my business, I said, I, my first prayer was, teach me to be the financial steward you need me to be with this money. Help me to use it the way you would have me to use it. And I was, I was, I don't, I, I never miss a tithe. We're going to keep tithing. Right. How I view it. I always look at it. Your testimony is for, for someone else. Right. So like, I always view it as like, you know what, that testimony though, probably came with some kind of pain, some kind of lesson. So I always tell them like, listen, learn from my mistakes and I learn from other people. So we don't have to repeat these same, these same mistakes. So yeah. Yeah. It's so how, I mean, you kind of nailed this already, but it is important to be your, your authentic self. Like it is really important. So I will tell you that one of the things that I've started doing recently, I share a number of your posts, your videos, your spoken words on my own social media pages, on the Redwood pages. Cause I think that every time I've talked to you actually, and I'm just going to share this with the audience, you've actually confirmed a prophetic word that has been spoken over my life that people just don't even know about. Like sometimes when God gives you a word or gives you vision, like, like I'm going to keep that to myself just because it's like, I'm not really ready to share this because God didn't give it to them. You know, he right. was to me through someone else directly is like, so I don't always put that out there, but you've confirmed things in my life that, that people don't know about. <laughs> how hard is it to let the public into your life through social media like like how how is that is that something that comes natural for you because it does not come natural for me <laughs> so you'd be I'm actually quite private people mm. think it's the opposite but I'm actually very private mm. um there's a lot of things in my life that that social media would never know yeah I'm actually very private I share exactly what I think is enough so it gives and I know I'm not trying to be secretive or deceptive in any way shape or form because what i share on there is true about me i'm a i'm a woman after god's own heart and i and i read my bible every day and i worship god on a daily basis and i love god with the core of me that is an absolute honest truth about me um but in terms of like intimate details and, and things of that nature i i'm very cautious and careful and I'm meticulous and strategic. Like what I share, I'm, I thought about it 10 times over before I shared it. Um, if it's personal or if it's about me. Now, when, when it comes down to testimony, I do believe that testimonies are supposed to be shared. Um, not every testimony has to be shared, but there are some testimonies that like, for sure, God was getting the glory and he absolutely needed you to tell that story. He got the glory for you to tell the story. And so I'm big on making sure I share the things that he gives me the grace to share. Um, but, but it, it's not that it's difficult to share on social media. It's just to me, there's a line that I draw in terms of what I'll allow. Um, and I don't cross the line of like private, intimate, personal matters and personal business and, and social media, networking, marketing, and, um, business and ministry. There you go. Yeah. I, I have, um, I have a team now thank God for who is doing my social media. And they're telling me you need to get on there and talk more. Just do it. it for me. It's hard because I'm actually more introverted than people realize. Like Same. they just, they just see me talking all the time and acting crazy. And they just assume, Oh, you're just this nice extroverted person. I'm like, listen, that took every bit of energy I had. I just want to go home and get on a blanket and hide in the pillows. Okay. <laughs> so. Me too. I'm a, I'm an introvert I, and people don't think that. And I'm like, Oh no, no, no. I just am really good at being extroverted in moments that it's necessary when it's time for me to show up in mm-hmm. social context, I will be the extrovert you need me to be, but I promise you my social battery runs out after a certain time. And at that point I will need to go rest. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm an introvert. So I get it. Yeah. My favorite. Um, I think that sometimes people see like courage and they take that as like an, an extrovert activity. It's like, no, God literally gave me this yeah. Get through this situation and then I'm going to go home and I'm going to read this book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you talked about some of the, the negative side of, of the influence. So who does influence you? Who motivates you? Like who, who encourages you in your life? Man. In terms of wisdom, it'd be my aunt Debbie. Mm. Uh, she's who I dedicated my devotional to my aunt Debbie taught me how to read my Bible. Mm. She taught me to read my Bible. 
Um, and she's 68. And she's amazing. Uh, she was my mother when I, uh, and then this is part of my testimony that people know that I didn't, my mother stopped raising me at 14 and my, my aunt stepped in and really, really filled her shoes. And she gave me so much wisdom and she still does. She's still around. And we talk every day, just about, we just came back from a, a, a mini trip together. She, and it was just, she and I, um, and it was hard for me to break away from work then too, by the way, but um, she motivates me to keep growing in Christ. And I believe the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. And, and so I seek God and I believe anything that he would have added unto my life, whether it's business, what, 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 whatever it is, connections, kingdom connections. Um, I, I believe that will follow suit, but my relationship with God is the most important relationship and she's who motivates me to keep building on that there we go shout out to her right that is that it's just that whole chain she poured into you and now look at what you're you're doing with those so with that with that information with that influence with so shout out to her so what throughout this process what has been what would you say has been my favorite experience so far like i've loved X, Y, or Z over anything else? What would you say your favorite experience has been so far? I, when you say process, is it pertaining to CCA or the totality of the ministry to include social media? I would say all of anything. I mean, because it's the whole journey of it all, whether it be some of them with the book, maybe with the academy. My favorite thing to do is, I, I'll be honest with you, and this, now this is the, the human part in me. <laughs> But, but mo- probably one of the most rewarding experiences is when I know that God has given me a Rima word, mm-hmm. timely Rima word, and I post a video on social media and the outpouring of love, um, the comments, when the comments say, girl, get out of my business. I love that. <laughs> or when the comments say, I really needed this. Mm-hmm. Or when the comments say things like, and I may not, I may never be able to get to all the comments, but I read them. I read, a, a, I would say majority of them. When the comments say things like, you just don't know how much this blessed me. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's like, it's in those moments that I go, gosh, this is so rewarding. But that reward comes after the obedience. Because I believe that the more time I spend with God, the more obedient I am and in doing what he calls me to do, the more sensitive I am to, and to, to the Holy spirit prompting me and, uh, the more inclined I am to hear him. And so then when, when he gives me a word and tells me to post a video on a specific thing and, and people, it's not that I don't know that God just said that, but when they validate it even more so by saying like, wow, like you really listen to, you really hear God. Like I have people literally type, like you really be hearing God. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It's like, it's such a beauty. It's a beautiful thing. Right. <laughs> it's great when you get the word. It feels so good when it's, when it's confirmed. It is just, yeah. you know, like, God, look at you. Like, look at you using me to just deliver that. It's thank you. Thank you for just even using me to do this. Like, it, it's humble. Yeah. It is humbling for me. Like, it is oh. very humbling. I'm with you. The Bible says, like, who am I that you are mindful? Like, who are we that you are mindful of us? And I go, I get, I, sorry, I could, I try not to cry, but I get like, my eyes get watery. Cause it's like, that's exactly how I feel. And then when he does use, use me and I, and I know without a shadow of a doubt that he just used me, I go me little old me, look how many people there are in the world. And you chose me to deliver that. I'm humbled, you know? So, cause you touched on your, your aunt previously. So is that where you would say your, your foundation like spiritually started? Yeah. I mean, my dad has always been one heck of a preacher. He can preach the roof off of a church. The man can preach, but he's not been consistent. I love my dad, but he's not been consistent with that specific calling. Mm -hmm. So in terms of being committed, consistent and devoted to preaching and, and to sharing the word of God, I would have to say that was, that was largely influenced and in, 
in my life by my aunt. My aunt influenced that. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. It's yeah. important you and I we talk about we've talked about this and you hear this a lot. Always surround yourself with the right people. You know, bad company can can corrupt good character. So how what does your circle look like now versus where it was before? And I mean before as in before Christ. So oh yeah. Oh yeah. So <laughs> Poor Christ. <laughs> I could fill a pool with my circle. <laughs> I could fill a I don't, trampoline park. Like I don't, I could, I could fill an arena with my circle. But and it's not to say that when you become Christian, you no longer have friends, but I heard Joyce Meyer say it best, but she said it's lonely at the top. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I was much younger and newer in, in following Jesus more closely. I was kind of sad for her. Like, what does she mean? She has no friends. Look how amazing she is. Why doesn't she have a lot of friends? And then as I grew and matured in Christ and, and I wasn't just drinking like milk yeah. and I was eating little, you know, meat and potatoes type of, type of preaching and taking in the word, I, I realized it's lonely at the top because not everybody is supposed to go with you there. And God forgive me for not remembering the name of a pastor, but I heard another pastor or preacher say it this way. He said, in the spiritual realm, we're on different levels and there's hierarchies, but we don't often talk about those hierarchies. And he, and he breaks down how the different angels are here and there. And, and he says, but even on in earth, we're spiritual beings. We're just passing by, but there is hierarchy. And he said, sometimes you don't realize where you are spiritually in that hierarchical context structure and you and your friends begin to fall off and even loved ones like family members and relatives and it's not that it's not because you're better than them or you know you feel like you're arrogant but it's because your spirit doesn't mesh with just any spirit and you've got to learn to accept that where god is moving you spiritually not everybody can can identify with it. Mm -hmm. And I mean that from a very humble place. Right. So I don't have a circle anymore, right? Mm -hmm. I have like, um, I have my son and my husband, my father, my stepmother, and my aunt. Mm -hmm. That's my support. There we go. You know, I, I think that God brings people into our lives or where he's where he's where we are and where he's going to take us so i mean i think he brings the right people in a time for the right season and some of those people are there for life some of them are just there for that particular moment that particular season so i don't want to i don't want to let you go without talking about this book so oh yeah i don't i don't because you clearly you've got a lot going on in your life so i do not want to let this this moment go by without talking about the book so talk about the devotional what was that process like where can we buy it? <laughs> all, oh, yeah. So thank you so much. So the book was it. Okay. So in the beginning, I was like, Oh, look at me. I'm an author. Look <laughs> at me. I'm, I'm like, I'm going to be published author. And I was writing that was so excited. But then I realized after a certain point, I was like, man, how many topics can I think about? Cause it's 365 days. You got to come up with 365 life topics. That's 365 verses and devotionals. And some are half pages, some are full pages. And I just kept saying, God, give me the grace and give me the foresight to, to see what it is that people would know or need in different seasons. And I kept just trying so hard to address every possible topic area, subject area. So there was a time where it was fun. It was exciting. And then there were times where it was like, I'm tired of doing this. Like I'm really tired of doing it. But I know that God has called me to it. Once again, a dream comes with much business and painful effort. So I understood that I wasn't going to be like a walk in the park every step of the way. Um, but I'm thankful that I was able to knock it out of the park and complete it. Um, by God's grace alone, it's got a lot of great reviews. And I mean, it's available on my website, drindialogan.com, particularly for signed copies. If you're not interested in having it signed, then amazon.com. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also available at your local Barnes and Noble, Target, Walmart. And it's, I'm, I'm just so excited. I'm very excited that it's, you know, easily accessible to everybody. 
I'm going to pull back the curtain just a little bit. So how hard, what is it like getting a book published? I, I don't know anything about that process. So for in case anyone is blind like me, what is that process like to get in this published and getting it put out there? You know, the first, I believe the first book is going to be far different from any other book because it's your first book and it's your baby, but it's also like you're getting your feet wet as an author and you're hopeful that it, it gains some traction and you get book deals again thereafter because of your quality of writing. Um, but the experience is, for me, I, the, the only word I can think of is like new and I was like venturing into the unknown and I needed to take some time to research how to negotiate and marketing and the parameters around that. <laughs> And so it was a joy, it was a pleasure. And I think it does depend on what specific publishing company you end up going with. Um, the one that I went with was fairly decent, um, but I'm hopeful that I'll have other opportunities with different publishing companies in the future. Nice, there we go. How long did it take to actually do the book? What was the, how, what was that process? It was a year journey. Uh, okay. It was a year journey because there were some preparatory stages that had to come into play. And then in terms of writing, they had deadlines that I had to meet every so often. And so, but in, in totality, the entire project took a year. Okay. Are there any more books in the works? Yes. Okay, yes. there we go. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I was like, maybe I shouldn't ask that question. This is a secret that I shouldn't be exposing right now. <laughs> so. No, this is, it's okay. There are a couple books in the works. I'm excited. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll stop digging. I'll stop digging right now. <laughs> yeah. That I don't believe an hour has gone by already. Like this is crazy to me. Oh. <laughs> I feel like I can sit here and just pick your brain, ask you questions all day. So um, that does bring in the final segment of the podcast, which is called Let Them Know. So this is your dime, your time. You tell the audience anything you want them to know, whatever you want to share. This is the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much for that. So large in part, I think the most important thing to remember in life is that there is no one on earth like God. Amen. And um, it is fundamental to your well-being spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally, to be rooted and grounded in a relationship with God. To be connected to him at all costs, come hella high water, and to never let go of him because he never lets go of you, that, lo that God loves you so intimately. And it's divine love, so it's far greater than our human comprehension, and our understanding could never really come to terms with the magnitude of his love and his grace, his mercy for us, and that there isn't a mistake that can separate us from his love, and that he supersedes our hopes dreams expectations his love grace and mercy abounds and that nothing in life is is bigger than the god we serve and so with god when you're teamed with god you're destined to be okay mm. because he never leaves nor forsakes us and he's got plans to prosper us grow us plans for hope in a future never to harm us and that he's a really good God that's deserving of all the, the praise, the glory, the honor. And that though we are not worthy, he loves us unconditionally. And that grace, that unmerited grace and favor that we receive is, is a gift that cannot be replicated. And it cannot be bestowed upon us by anyone else but him. Yeah. The doctor, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. We appreciate having you on. I would love to have you back on at some point because I'm sure you've yeah. got more big things coming down the road. So I do. Yeah. thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it as well. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.